For thousands of years, Native Americans lived in North America with a very, very, very special connection to the land. Native American cuisine is often overlooked or misunderstood. I'm going to show you some traditional recipes that date back thousands of years. We begin with maple baked beans. Native Americans made them long before the famous Boston baked beans. We're going to fry up some catfish. Also going to make a stuffed squash in keeping with the trinity, which is corn, squash, and beans. Very essential in the diets. We're going to finish with corn and dried cranberry pancakes. Eating like our Native American friends is just not only reconnecting with the land, but it also is a very special taste of history. Baked beans and almonds with uh, New England have uh, really been around for a long, long time and part of the Native American diet. The way you make those uh, uh, baked beans, that actually are getting the name Boston baked beans because they were d dominantly introduced in the Northeast, is you take navy beans that you got to soak in water, like all legumes, they have to be soaked. You cannot just take them from a dry stage, but you must remember the reason so many of the legumes were used is because they would absolutely winter, they last the whole time in burlap bags, so they would not spoil. So what you do is you take navy beans that you soak in water, overnight you want to soak them. Native Americans, a trillion years ago, discovered how to penetrate the bark of the maple tree to extract the syrup and cook it down. Henceforth, maple syrup is also a sign of spring because it's the time of the year when the maple tree is full of sap. Next is brown sugar. I'll put in some mustard. I like a little dry mustard in my baked beans. I'm sure the Native Americans didn't use it, but it tastes awfully good. Now, I want to add water into the beans and in the fire they go. All right, just add water into it. Stew it all up. And then the fire goes. You want to cook that on a slow fire. You got to be very careful because it's full of sugar and syrup that has a tendency to burn real easy. Today, if you want to make dirt, obviously I give you a little hint. A crock pot or a slow cooker works extremely well in not taking a chance to burning it. The Lenape people lived in the great state of Pennsylvania, were very good friends of William Penn, but got taken advantage of by his sons. On an early September morning, three runners started out at the Reichstown Quaker Meeting House for the infamous walking purchase. The walking purchase is not a very fond memory for a lot of Lenape or otherwise known as Delaware Indians. William Penn. In his great holy experiment, he started Philadelphia, where he wanted everyone to live together in peace, including the, the Native Americans that lived here. The Lenape tribe lived along the Delaware River when William Penn came to America. Penn was careful to treat the Lenape tribe fairly, buying land from them for colonial settlement. But his sons, Thomas and John Penn, after their father's death, decided they wanted more Lenape land and came up with a scheme to get it for free. They approached these Lenape with a deed. They said this deed went back to 1686, giving this land to William Penn. Despite having no recollection of the deed, the Lenape, who were weakened by disease and war and feeling pressure from their Iroquois overlords, agreed to the 1737 walking purchase. It was as much land as a man can walk in a day and a half. And to Lenape and other Native Americans, this was a typical way of doing things. So they agreed. Thomas and John Penn hired three of the fastest men in the colony, Edward Marshall, Solomon Jennings, and James Yates, to represent them. They promised that if you make this, you'll get five pounds plus 500 acres of land if you do this thing. They already surveyed the land. Penn brothers did this, John and Thomas, and they picked up the choicest pieces of land. They knew what they wanted, and they wanted far more than what the Delaware were offering. At dawn on September 19, 1737, 
The Penn brothers' three runners and three witnesses from the Lenape tribe, along with a judge hired by the Penns, met at the Wrightstown Meeting House to begin their walk. But they took off at such a breakneck speed that many of the Lenapes complained right away, this is not right, they're running. In only two and a half hours, the men had covered 19 miles of land. The Lenapes were distraught, but the runners continued anyway. Jennings, one of the Penn's runners, gave up from exhaustion and went home. The remaining two men managed to run until dusk. The next morning, the Lenape protested to the judge that this was not fair, trying to convince the judge to stop the walk. They decided they would no longer participate and left. But the runners kept going. Within 10 miles, one of the second men, John Yates, fell from exhaustion, so exhausted that he went blind, and a couple of days later, he actually died. So Edward Marshall was on his own? Yeah. From there on in, he went off on his own, but he made it. It's 2 o'clock. 65 miles. He dropped from exhausted. Congratulations. But that wasn't the end of it. You see, because that was just a straight line. In the original contract, it said that once you walked a day and a half, you would take a mark eastward to the Delaware. And they didn't do that. They cheated. They took it northeast. They actually made a right angle, went all the way up. The equivalent of 750,000 acres of prime property were taken from these poor people. After the walking purchase in justice, some of the newly arrived settlers treated the Lenape terribly. They were given alcohol to get drunk and beaten, and their women raped. The conditions were so deplorable, the Lenape had no choice but to leave their ancestral home. They went out west to the Alleghenies and out the Ohio region, which was not a good thing. They joined up with French, and they turned around with other Native groups and came back. And before you know it, you might have heard of the French and Indian I War, but <laughs> not a good time for the people in Philadelphia. I'm sure many times you watch my show, you maybe make some popcorn, right? <laughs> you better. But let me tell you something. Popcorn is a Native American invention. They actually passed it on to the early settlers. And to make popcorn, obviously, I'm sure you're doing it in your automatic popcorn popper. I'm going to show you how we do that the old-fashioned way. A little touchy, a little bit of oil. If you've been camping and you made popcorn on an open fire, you also know how fast it can burn. So <laughs> you want to keep a, a good air on it, you're going to hear a pop. Well, the pot is heating up. Let's talk a few other things. So just churgy. Now, this happens to be buffalo churgy. We take churgy for granted, but remember, the Native Americans needed churgy because after their got a buffalo, they may don't have any protein for a long time. And the Native American hunters would have them on their belt to give them some animal protein. Fantastic. So next time when you go stop in the gas station and see some churkeys in plastic wrap, don't think it's just something we invented. Our Native American brothers eaten this for thousands of years. Music to my ears. I hear my corn popping. Let's check. Let's check. We can see how we done here. Oh golly, how beautiful is that? Yeah. Oh yeah. Now you're talking popcorn, huh? Take your microwave and throw it out. That's the only way to go. Thank you, my Native American friends, for introducing us to popcorn. And now you know why it's called popcorn. Because it really pops. <laughs> Sunflower seeds, we take for granted, and many people actually ask me or tell me it came from Eastern Europe. Uh -uh. Sunflower seeds is something else that the American, the Native Americans adored. They made the oil out of it, but something even more so important, it can be called Jerusalem artichokes or sunchokes. It is the root of the sunflower. That root is attributed to a lot of medicinal purposes, and it was our Native American friends that introduced it to the early settlers, and to this day it makes medicine, and it's just a fantastic dish. I'm going to make it later as a vegetable, and again, the point is that our Native American friends lift off the land as much vegetable as possible and a little bit of hunting and fishing. The three sisters are 
corn, beans, and squash. Squash, which is part of the Trinity, was eaten a lot, but not the green squash as we know, we call zucchini. It was the summer squash we had here. And you know they get bigger sizes. Now we're looking for vegetables that are, that are small or miniature, then you let it get big. And the bigger, the more it would feed. So let me show you this recipe. It's basically, I have onion, I chop really quick. And what's interesting about this recipe, that it uses cornbread. I'll show you this in a moment. So I have onion, I have some bear bacon. You can use any bacon, substitute anything like that. Then I have my cornbread, and the cornbread, all I do is crumble the cornbread up. You make this recipe, you don't need any seasoning because you have all the seasoning already in the cornbread. So the cornbread goes in here. I have some parsley, put in here. And I have some chives. Our Native American friends really believed and a lot of healing power and spiritual power of chives. And now we got to prep the squash. So the squash could be even larger than that, and I'm sure they would have had it, but now everybody is growing the vegetables smaller. So all you got to do is cut it in half. Now you take any kind of spoon and just take the inside out. That's it, like that. I made a few already ready. Now this one you have to use your hands. There's no other way to do it, because you want to mix it really good. Then when it's like so, you take it, and you roll it up and stuff it in your squash. And once you have it in there, it goes on the oven. It doesn't take long at all. You just want to brown off the, the top. And when you brown the top, the squash will be cooked, somewhat al dente. And all you want to do, put in a, any kind of a roasting pan, put just a little bit of oil on the bottom. And you put it in the oven at about 375 for maybe 10 minutes, no more than that. During the American Revolution, many of the Native American tribes were loyal to England. George Washington organized troops to push the Native Americans into Canada. When the colonies decided to leave the kingdom, if you will, and, and revolt, the majority of the natives retained their loyalties to the king. Why would we fight the strongest army in the world? Our farms were prosperous, our roads were in good repair, and that was all due to the king and the influence of his army. We'd just driven the French from the continent, and things were good for us. As colonial settlers spread out further and further into Native American territories looking for rich farmland, a conflict was sure to ensue. Natives attacked settlers with increased frequency, sometimes at the instigation of British loyalists. Frontier settlements were burned and colonists were scalped, kidnapped, or killed. As the Revolutionary War started, George Washington felt pressure to do something about the Native Americans, since some of the tribes were feeding and supporting British troops, while others were allied with the colonists. Washington devised a plan to literally remove the Iroquois from central New York and hopefully break the alliance with the British. The Sullivan Expedition, led by Major General John Sullivan, sought to wipe out four nations of Iroquois by burning their crops and destroying their villages. It was the largest campaign of 1779, and it encompassed a full 25% of the active U.S. military at the time. It was an enormous undertaking. The advancing Continental Army fought a combination of British soldiers, loyalists, and tribes of the Iroquois nation. These rebels, these sons of violence, not sons of liberty, were attacking and burning our farms. Mr. Washington thinks if he can wipe out their food supply, he'll change the, the prosperity of the British in the city. We hear he's on his way to Fort Niagara, and we're here to stop that. The British and the Indians hope to ambush them and either turn them around or demoralize them to the point that they were no longer effective. The Iroquois Confederacy fought as a unit with the king. You fought wars of reproach, revenge for land, but this unknown concept of liberty was foreign to all of us. Sullivan's intent was not so much to inflict heavy casualties. It was to 
eliminate a way of life and remove them from the alliance to make them dependent upon the British. And from that standpoint, it worked. Washington cut the British off from their food supplies. Sullivan's march pushed the Iroquois Confederacy up toward Canada, where many died that cold, harsh winter from starvation. But before they did, they ravaged settlers with attacks on the frontier. It was their one last desperate attempt at revenge. If you ever seen giant sunflower fields or picked a sunflower, you would see below the root that looks something like that. It's called, in many cultures, it was an amatichok or sunchok, full of nutrients. What makes it unique and why I like it so much as a vegetable, you could eat them raw, they're quite crunchy in a salad, or you could just saute them quickly with some onions and some garlic and a little bit of uh, sunflower oil. Sunflower oil was the preferred oil of most of the Native Americans. Preparation is simple, but it's a really great side dish. All you want to make sure that you wash them really good, have a Dutch chicken in hot. All right, my pot over here, sunflower oil, which I have in my bottle, garlic, onion, goes under fire. Deglaze middle white wine or a little chicken stock, or in my case, just a little bit of water. So we're going to cook that maybe at a good heat, maybe five, six minutes, no more than that. Add salt, a little bit of pepper, chives, and parsley, and the dish is served. The complement together meet most likely the next dish we're making, which is catfish. As we're celebrating, the Native Americans, one of the many dishes we know for a fact was really precious for the Lenape Indians that were around the mid-Atlantic region, and it was catfish. Matter of fact, so much so they named some of the streams where the catfish could be found, like Wissahickon. By and large, they would eat a lot of vegetables and obviously some animal protein. Five animals we know of were sacred to them. They wouldn't touch the rattlesnake, the wolf, the wild cat, and the hare and the ground hog. So this recipe is really simple. What's unique about it is that you gotta buy a very beautiful catfish. Like this is a really beautiful piece of catfish. All you wanna do is a little lemon or lime juice, either way you like. So a little lemon juice, a little pan, a little bit, some salt. Salt normally I don't put until much later, but we're gonna immediately fry it once we have it breaded some pepper to it, and then it's a very simple procedure that everybody has done a million times, I'm sure, and it is kind of like, it goes into all-purpose flour, very generous, it's going to hold up good, all-purpose flour, just into some egg wash, and then into cornmeal, and in the sunflower oil it goes, cornmeal, and you really want to make that Good amount of cornmeal on it, make sure it holds good. The proper temperature of the sunflower oil is obviously important. You don't want to make it too hot, because if it gets too hot, it burns the outside of the cornmeal and your fish is raw on the inside. So a gentle temperature, like I'm having here, is what you want to do. And you want to keep an eye on it. And technically, once the, the cornmeal is nice and brown and you can lift the tail, it should be cooked. Now those fillets today were on the thick side, so they take it a little longer and some of the more skinnier that you find in fish markets. Ooh. The trick, if you want to make sure that your fish is done, there's one absolute certain way. You should break off the tail. When the tail is broken like that, you can see the fish is completely beautifully cooked. Wow. I salute our Native American brothers and sisters for bringing us great food and maintaining it. There's nothing better than a fantastic piece of catfish fried in cornmeal in sunflower oil, no less. Fantastic. Remember, we're dealing in the 18th century. Native Americans have been here much longer than that, and so are the settlers. Initially, the flour they would have used for this dish would have not been regular wheat flour. Would have could have been acorn, all kind of different nuts, things that turned into flour. But early on, 
the Native Americans start trading with the settlers. They got Dutch pots from them, they got flour, they got sugar, they got all kinds of goodies. So this recipe today is maybe a more modern version of the early Native American recipe. The first thing I'm going to do is reach over to my corn that I cooked very, very delicately, very slow. I don't want any big uh, color on those. I just want to nicely cook. And I'm going to take the husk off. All I want to do, cut down the kernels real quick. If you leave them whole, you don't get the flavor because those are sun-dried cranberries. So when you chop them open, the flavor comes out. Add this to my corn. Now comes the interesting part. Any kind of wild herbs or herbs that would grow on the riverbank, such as mint, such as oregano, and such as sage. Just a really rough chop. The mint is just beautiful. I have some oregano. So the sage, little oregano, little thyme, whatever you can get your hands on it, actually. There's no specific recipe. Just chop it in. Put in there. Now comes the batter, which is very simple. All-purpose flour, and I mentioned earlier, the flour would have earlier not been available. A little baking powder. Some salt, because remember those are not sweet, those are savory. The milk. Like any batter you make, slowly add your liquid into it. Get a whisk in here. Too much liquid in the beginning, you'll be stuck. So you can always add, but you can never take away. Let's just mix it up a little bit. All right. And it's got to be thick enough so it's a binder for all the ingredients that go in it. And chop a few chives because chives are very important to the Native Americans. They believe it had magical powers because when a chai flower blooms, it has a purple flower and it, it, it goes in high altitude, so they are attached to their spirit, I think. At least I'm attached to their spirit. How is that? <laughs> All right. Put some oil on my griddle. All right, tuning, baby. Ah. Mm. Man, oh man. Celebrate food today on A Taste of History. And look at here, I have the three sisters. I have my beans. In this particular case, I made them into Boston baked beans. I got the squash, and I've got the corn that I've incorporated in this unbelievable fritters, also incorporated cranberries. The catfish is right here. The sunchocks, or the roots of the sunflower, cooked right here. And the squash, which is one of my favorite, made a bear, ham. I'll try a little bit of my pancake here. Isn't that beautiful? Let me try you. I could eat it every day of the week. It is fantastic. The herbs, the cranberry, the corn, don't get better than that.